Um, this is going to be a different kind of sermon, and I, <laughs> meaning, I'm going to tell you some things from the Bible, but this is not. This is going to require a, maybe a different level of thinking about the world, um, and. <sighs> I hate to say the word trigger warning, but I'm going to give you a trigger warning because there's, <laughs> we're going to talk about some things that are hard to hear. This is something that I think requires somebody that's really thinking uh, deeply. Um, but it's, it's, I think, true. And I think that this is the audience that can understand it and hear it uh, for what it is and not take it the wrong way. Um, and, and so now everybody that's uneasy uh, and worried about what I'm about to say, um, it's not that bad, I promise. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about how to identify the sin of subjectivity. And you, you, you might like that, but I hope you don't. I want to talk about art for a minute. Uh, painting, architecture, sculpture, music, whatever. Um, Art presents itself in a lot of different ways, doesn't it? A lot of people now even consider like video games to be an art medium or an art form, right? When uh, we think about the history of art, we can see how it has changed over time. And some of the most ancient little statues, I don't know if you've ever seen these things, I forget what they're called, but they look like these these, these chubby little th things that barely resemble people um, uh, are like some of the earliest sculptures. And like cave art is uh, pretty crude, you know, it looks like a baby with a crayon maybe did it. Um, and over time, with each advent of new civilizations that come into being, art becomes more and more realistic over time, right? Classical Greece, you know, classical Roman uh, art, is like this pinnacle of realism that's not achieved again until like the Renaissance period, right? But people are always trying to mimic what is true and what is real. And most of us, when we look at this art from classical Greece and from the Renaissance, we look at it in a type of awe, don't we? I mean, I remember looking at these marble statues and thinking to myself, how could they make it look so real? And the, the fabric and the muscles and everything looks so exactly the way that it is in life. We see its realism and we marvel at its beauty. And there's a reason why we do is because it's a reflection of God's true creation, the greatest thing that is, the, the master of the universe, his canvas, right? We're, we're, we're looking and admiring people imitating what God created, right? Uh, we're drawn to it, and we appreciate for it for what it is and what it represents, this work of God. Psalm 19.1 says, For the director of music, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. It's beautiful, huh, that uh, landscape. The beauty of this art is not subjective, it is objective. We look at it on the outside and we can see that it is beautiful. People sought to pour their energies and their strengths into emulating what God created. They drew their inspiration from humility to copy the master of all beauty. This desire for emulating true brute beauty progresses into what we see in the Renaissance, and that's probably the height of that emulation. But after the Renaissance, there's new art that begins to develop, that diverges from this emulation of what was created by God and what is creation. People began to distort and obscure what was natural, and they accepted and created what was unnatural. It started small, like pointillism and impressionism and cubism, and it went on and on, and as it went on, it got more and more distorted until art becomes an expression of the self, no longer an expression of God's creation, but an expression of our feelings, our insides, and even something that is offensive 
to what is truly beautiful. It becomes more about the artist than it does about the art itself. Where someone burning a flag is seen as art, or even as the scandal in the 1980s, I remember growing up as a kid and seeing this, and there being a huge deal about it, that somebody placed a cross in a bucket of urine uh, and called that art and took a picture of it and, won, and got $5,000 from the National Endowment of the Arts and won all these awards. So st stunning and strong and brave. I would hate to be that guy on Judgment Day just saying. But anyway, this art no longer imitates what is beautiful, but it violates it. This art focuses on how it makes you feel, not what is objectively beautiful and created by God. It no longer is an objective beautiful thing that exists outside of us, but is something that is only loved by the eye of the beholder. It depends on the person. It becomes subjective. New art is subjective. It is about the story of the artist and not about the beauty of the art itself. It is no longer a reflection of God's glory, but is a mockery of it. This art also represented, represents a departure of a people that objectively respected and honored God to a people that gained satisfaction from honoring themselves. Now, the reason why this is a difficult topic is obvious, right? And there's a lot of people, they might feel a certain way about art. But that's what we're talking about. It's subjective. It is about our feelings, not about what is objectively true and beautiful and good. The saddest very heart is the essence of what pride is. And as we know what the Bible teaches, that pride is a sin. To deny honoring God in favor of honoring the self. To mock God with something only its creator could love. This denial of God's majesty has taken one step after another. In its audacity, it disrespects it. It is not just contained to art, but to so many things that are commonplace in our culture. Art is the, 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 the fruit of what the culture is doing. It is an expression. It is, it is an idea uh, that plasters itself for everyone to see of what the culture is going through. Art is only a symptom of the sickness that is permeating so many other things in our society. Take, if you will, the practice of abortion. God has created us for life. He has, God has placed life within the womb of a woman, and a child grows in that place by God's design. Right? It says in Psalm 1, 39, 13, and 14, For you created my innermost parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Abortion is an act of defiance against God's will, God's design. It is an act of pride. It is an act of seizing one's destiny from God, changing one's path from the path that God has given them. To not submit, but instead have a subjective desire of the self instead of relenting to God's majesty. To choose death over life. It is essentially giving in to the self and telling God no. It is also a sin because it is cutting off the life of one who cannot speak or defend themselves. Most people would not choose to die for the sake of someone else's convenience, and that is the vast, vast majority of why all abortions are committed. It is because of convenience, because of lifestyle, not because of all the things that people claim it's for. It's usually because it's inconvenient. Our society has tried everything they can to suppress the voice of unborn children so people are not faced with the guilt associated with the choices that they make. The sin of subjectivism is always making everything about ourselves, being concerned with 
ourselves. It is placing what we want over what God commanded us to do. It is making things that are objective and true into things that are subjective and only represent our own personal truth, your truth. I even heard the vice president say she was thankful that someone was expressing their truth uh, the other day. And you hear that all the time, don't you? What is my truth? Because it is different for every person. It is subjective based on what a person likes or dislikes. It's really not objective at all. It has no real truth. It is based on feelings and emotions rather than what is real. It is just like modern art. It is exactly the same expression. It is exactly the same thing. Modern art is an expression of the person's personal truth, what they like, what they desire. It is that plastered on a canvas or in some other medium. Another exam example of subjective morality and placing ourselves above God is through various acts of sexual immorality. People are addicted to pornography because of how it makes them feel. People are addicted to same-sex attraction because they're placing their own desires over what God has designed for them. People live together as if they were married without the commitment that God has demanded because they really are only thinking of themselves and what they want. They're thinking about how it makes them feel, not how God wants them to be. It says in Romans 1, 26 through 32, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, where their women exchanged natural relations for that which was contrary to nature. And likewise, the men too abandoned natural relations with women and burned in their desire towards one another, males with males committing shameful acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And that's the key verse in this passage. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, they rejected God. People having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, un feeling and unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Key to this passage, like I said, is in verse 28. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. They did not seek to emulate his beauty with their art, with their heart, with all that is in them. They sought only to create something that they liked for themselves, their own personal truth, their subjective belief and truth in all expression, including in their art. They refused to honor God, to embrace what is truly and objectively beautiful. People stopped hearing and honoring God. People stopped making art that imitates God's objective beauty in favor of subjective desires, in favor of things that were beauty in the eye of the beholder. People stopped caring about God's commands in favor of their own commands, in favor of what made them happy. People rejected God's direction and destiny for their lives, <clears throat> and people chose their own destinies through subjection to pride and the sins that come from pride. These choices of the self are not without consequence, as Paul warns us in this passage. What he warns to people who practice such things. Our society is so steeped in pride, so steeped in relativism, relativism that it is hard to even recognize the world without it. We think about relative morality, even without thinking about it. But recognize it, we must, lest we be swallowed up by its false logic, by its ridiculousness, by its appealing nature, 
to our baser instincts. The best way to recognize it, though, is by knowing and understanding what God and who God is. And we do that by immersion into his wisdom and into his word. Because the Bible is full of hard truths because they call us out for our sins. They call us out. It calls us out for our pride. It calls us out for our immorality. It tells us when we're wrong. And it tells us what we do, what will happen if we don't fix what's wrong. That we're going to come face to face with some serious consequences for those choices. It also tells us how to find redemption, how to start a new life and turn over a new leaf. It tells us how to find hope and everlasting life. So there's that. And that's the good side of it. But in order to embrace the good, we have to get rid of the bad. They are not, the Bible does not always give us the answers that we seek, but it always gives us the answers that we need. And we need them now more than ever. So we should endeavor to ground ourselves in God's word, in his truth, in his beauty, and let us not be lured away by subjectivism and the desire to challenge God, but instead emulate ourselves off of what God has designed and to live based on his perfect example through his son, Jesus Christ. At this time, I will offer an invitation. If there is anybody that wishes to come forward for any reason, I want to encourage you to do that this evening. If you're wanting to become a Christian, know that those who believe in God, who repent of their sin and be, are baptized, God has promised forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. That's on your heart this evening. I want to encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing our closing song.